Hi, uh, welcome. In my series on science, today we'll talk about the Big Bang. The Big Bang is essentially the theory of how the universe came to be. And in the last century, we have made a huge progress towards understanding the working of the universe as well as how the universe came by. Uh, and that's what we'll talk about today. So let's start with the night sky. When we look at the night sky, we see so many stars. In fact, we are often told as children that we there are infinite stars in the night sky. If we and if we try to count, we could not count them. That is not true. Uh, uh, the number of stars in the night sky, even on the most darkest nights, is about two to three thousand. Uh, that doesn't mean, though, that there are few stars. Uh, it the number of stars in the in the universe is about ten to the power twenty two. Uh, which is 10 billion trillion stars. Uh, these stars, however, are not scattered randomly uh, in the night sky. They are actually clustered in uh, these little clusters, uh, and there is huge space bet between these clusters. And these clusters are known as galaxies. Uh, and our star, Sun, is part of one such galaxy, the galaxy is Milky Way. Uh, but how do we know all this? Uh, before the time of Edwin Hubble, it was believed that ours was the only galaxy, that there was only one galaxy of which our star was part of. It was Edwin Hubble who showed that not only there are many galaxies, he also worked on finding out the distance of these galaxies. But the question is, and, and this, is, this is Edwin Hubble, he was he was born in 1889 and he started in 1925 as an astronomer at Mount Wilson and one of the things he worked there was to estimate the distance of galaxies. Mount Wilson at that time had one of the biggest telescopes in the world. But the question is how does one go about finding the distance to a galaxy? How do you, how do you sit at home or in a laboratory and say oh let's try to estimate the distance of galaxy? How does one go about finding the distance to a galaxy? The answer is that you can estimate the distance of stars that are near to you uh, using star parallax. We already talked about it in one of our older lectures. Um, the farther the star is, the lesser the parallax. Let's talk about parallax quickly. Parallax is, is the relative displacement of an object uh, in the background of a farther object. So let's say if I have a thumb and I move and if I look at it in the background of a tree far away, what I see is that the tree is stationary and it seems that my thumb is moving as I move my head. Um, similarly, when the Earth goes on its orbit around the Sun, the stars that are near us, they appear to shift in position in the backdrop of farther stars and that's parallax. Parallax is, is not visible for stars that are very, very far away, but for the stars that are closer, the parallax is visible and using the apparent displacement or the parallax you can estimate the distance. But the distance of farther stars is calculated indirectly using the apparent brightness of the stars. So you see when you look at the night sky and you look at a star some are bright some are not that bright. The apparent brightness only depends on two things. One is its luminosity which is the amount of light that it emits. The more light it emits the more bright it will appear to be. And the second is its distance. The farther the star, the lesser apparent brightness it will have because it's farther away. Uh, so apparent brightness depends on these two things. In our own galaxy, we know how bright a star is because we can observe it and find out its apparent brightness as well as we know its distance which we calculated using star parallax. So using these two, we can figure out its luminosity which is the amount of light that the star emits. Now assume the farther star. What, what scientists realize is that there are some stars for which this luminosity is always the same. So if we assume that similar stars in different galaxies have a similar luminosity that they are emitting similar amount of light then from their apparent brightness and their luminosity we could indirectly compute their distances. And this way we can compute the distance of one for a star that is very far away. And what you could do is you could compute the distance of multiple stars in its vicinity that are close to it and you can compute the distance. When we compute such a distance, this distance to those stars come out to be the same. And what that proves is that those stars which are closer to each other are in a galaxy because the distance to them turns out to be 
is computed to be the same and that also shows that those stars are in a galaxy because interstar inter distance is so small compared to the distance of it from to us <laughs> so that proves they are in a they are in a cluster which is called a galaxy and uh, the distance to those stars is the distance of that galaxy so Hubble calculated the estimated the distance of nine different galaxies this way and imagine how far this would have brought us in the understanding of the universe 2000 years ago which is nothing compared to millions and billion years of uh, evolution of the universe and the earth uh, mere 2000 years ago Aristotle and Ptolemy thought that uh, earth was the center of the universe and that the sun and the moon and the stars went around the earth round and round and now our earth was just an ordinary planet which which uh, went around an ordinary sun and that ordinary sun was part of an, an ordinary galaxy and there were billions of galaxies in the universe but this was not the only thing that Edwin Hubble discovered there was another great thing and that was the red shifted pattern you see when when you see when light is passed through prism and Newton displayed it uh, that if when light is passed through a prism it is composed of patterns red green blue you can you can you can create a spectrum of uh, that white light similarly when light from stars is uh, is passed through a prism you can see the spectrum from it now depending on the elements or the chemical that are present in the star some light is absorbed some chemicals absorb certain light of certain wavelengths certain colors and so what you will see if you look at the spectrum is that there will be a dark band let's say star has hydrogen and hydrogen I don't know assumes let's say it, it absorbs blue light then you will see a dark band around blue light and in fact from these absorption lines those dark bands are called absorption lines. you can find out the co chemical composition of elements that are present in the stars so what Hubble did is that he calculated the spectrum of stars from our own galaxy and you could see various uh, absorption line depending on the patterns or the elements in the stars in our galaxy and he also looked at the spectrum of stars in another galaxy and they looked very much the same except there was a very very crucial difference it was that the spectrum was shifted slightly towards the red side the line that was supposed to be here was shifted slightly towards the red side the line that was supposed to be here was again shifted towards the red side what does this mean to understand what the shifting of these patterns toward the red side we have to first understand the Doppler effect the Doppler effect as the name suggests is due to Christian Doppler who was born in 1803 and Doppler effect is something that we observe in our lives on a day-to-day -day basis whenever there is a train or there is a vehicle that is honking comes towards us and then leaves away you can see that as it is coming towards us the sound changes the sound is different when it is approaching us and the sound is different when it is moving away from us the sound is at higher frequency when it is approaching us and at a lower excuse me frequency when it is moving away similar is true of light when light is is moving away from us then uh, the light that the observer receives is at a uh, lower frequency and when the source is moving towards us the apparent light that we receive is at a higher frequency and what that means is that let's say you have a yellow light source and it is moving towards you then the light that you will see if it is moving pretty fast towards you light that you will see will have a higher frequency higher frequency means blue uh, or violet and if it is moving to away from you then the light source has the apparent uh, wavelength will be the frequency will be lesser and uh, lesser frequency means that it is towards the red so the fact that these patterns are red shifted suggests that these galaxies are moving away from us and this was an amazing discovery and it came by chance that these galaxies are moving away from us in fact yet more amazing fact was published by Hubble in 1929 which was that uh, these patterns were not random I mean the redshift was not random the farther the galaxy the more the redshift, a galaxy that was pretty close only had slight redshift 
and then the galaxy that was very far away had more redshift. In fact, these redshifts were directly proportional to the distance. If a galaxy was twice far away, it was moving twice as fast from us. The universe as we know of it was exp is, is expanding. And this is Hubble's law which says that velocity of receding velocity of a galaxy is, is equal to h0 which is a constant, Hubble's constant, time the distance of the galaxy. Velocity is directly proportional to its distance from us. This leads us to the Big Bang Theory. You see, if galaxies are moving, are expanding as time passes by, what if we go back in time? That suggests that the galaxies would have been closer to each other as compared to where they are now. And what happens if we go yet further in time? If you go yet further in time, would it, is it possible that if we go keep on going back in time, we keep on going back in times, millions of years, billions of years, that the universe was really small? The theory that the universe once was indeed very, very small, that it fit inside as small as an atom, was published by George Lemaitre in uh, 1927. And this was two years before uh, Hubble published his results in 1929. Uh, according to Big Bang Theory, the universe originated one in, with, from an extremely dense, imagine how dense it will have to be to have all the galaxies, all the stars, all our sun, earth and all the planets and moons, everything inside an atom. And it expanded from there. It continues to cool down and expand even today. And that is what we see today as we see that the, that the galaxies recede from each other or expand. The, this theory, however, did not go well with all the scientists. There was an alternative theory, which is the steady state theory. Ever, let's talk about it. So ever since from the beginning of wise men, ever people have found solace in the fact or have believed that the universe is static. Even from the time of Aristotle, it was believed that the world beyond the moon was immutable, that it was never changing. This was however proven to be wrong by, by Tycho Brahe when, we ob when he observed a new star, if you remember from previous lecture. But somehow humans, because we are a species that fear death, that we know we die, we per perhaps find solace in the fact that even if we pass on, the universe will always be here, that uh, the universe will, will always be here, that it has always been here and that it will always be here. Even Einstein was, was strongly strongly believed in the idea that universe is appears similar on large scale in time. What that means is that if you if you go back a million years or if you go forward a million years, universe will perhaps look similar on large scale. Uh, the steady state theory essentially is the same theory that, that states that the universe appears similar on large scale and it explains the fact that uh, the universe expands by saying that more matter is generated at the core of the universe as the previous ones or the older ones die out. But which of these theories should we believe? Uh, well, we should use the scientific way. And what is the scientific way? The scientific way is that any theory must make a definite prediction which could be falsified by observation. That is why astrology is also not a science because it cannot make a definite prediction and if it does make a prediction, a definite prediction, you can certainly falsify it by observation. Cosmic microwave background radiation is one of the observations that Big Bang Theory predicts. This, this, uh, uh, this uh, prediction is the following, that when the universe was very small, if the universe once was very small and very hot and very dense, it must have resulted in emitting a large amount of microwave radiation. And we should be able to detect that microwave radiation uh, today as well. And if we can, if we can, uh, this is the prediction, if we can observe it, that would be a very strong argument towards Big Bang Theory. And it was indeed discovered in 1965 to uh, scientists were working in New Jersey uh, and they were testing out for telecommunication purposes a very sensitive microwave detector but their equipment was was capturing more uh, noise than they than they expected 
and this noise was same whether or not whether they pointed their apparatus towards the horizon or towards uh, uh, towards the horizon or directly overhead uh, the noise was same so this meant that the noise was coming out of the atmosphere if if a disturbance results in atmosphere the resulting disturbance is less if you point it directly overhead because there is less atmosphere to cover similarly the noise was independent of whether it was day or night it was independent of the month so it was independent essentially of where the earth was in its orbit around the sun so what that meant is that this noise came outside of the solar system and this was actually the cosmic microwave background radiation which the scientists have predicted this was this is considered to be one of the biggest discoveries of uh, of uh, big bang and many believe this is the greatest proof of big bang there was once a huge debate between uh, scientists between big bang theory and steady state theory but the discovery of uh, cmb uh, converted majority of the scientists to believe in big bang and the two two scientists who were working on the at bell labs they received nobel prize for this another prediction of uh, big bang theory is the abundance of lighter elements uh, it is believed that the universe started in an extremely dense and hot state and then it started to cool down within three minutes it had cooled down to 10 to the power 9 kelvin and that is when matter started building uh, building up the chemical elements started to show up hydrogen started uh, building up and then hydrogen combined two hydrogen combined and became helium and then helium combined and uh, became other heavier elements and because hydrogen was the one that that uh, was uh, generated in the beginning it uh, is support it is predicted to be most I mean it is believed that hydrogen should be abandoned and that is found to be true by observation in our universe hydrogen is indeed the most abundant element 73 percent hydrogen by mass 25 percent helium by mass and only two percent of other lighter elements so this is another observation that is explained by as well as predicted by the big bang theory so concluding in the last century we have made huge advancements in our understanding of the universe the the stars in the night sky are clustered in galaxies and these galaxies are very far away and there are billions of galaxies in our universe uh, and each galaxy has billions of stars and the universe expands with the farther galaxies moving faster away from us. It also shows that 13.8 billion years ago it predicts an event called known as the Big Bang in which the universe started. September 25, 2012, NASA released this image and I consider this an extremely humbling image which shows the deepest optical view uh, that I, we have in, uh, in this space. This shows galaxies from even 13.2 billion years ago, only, only 0.6 billion years ago after the Big Bang. And it shows the galaxies shown here are so far apart that the lights must have taken millions of years to travel to us it I mean the light that we receive from these galaxies today must have started from their own galaxy when dinosaurs roamed on this planet it's called the Hubble extreme deep field image as we talk about the genesis or the beginning of the universe we should also think about how the universe will end will the universe be always be here for time positive infinite time or will it also end the scientific belief on that is that the universe will end and it will end in a big freeze. The stars will continue to cool down. The temperature of the universe will continue to uh, go down and down and down and it will asymptotically re reach absolute zero. And that's how the universe will end in a big freeze. But do not let that worry you. Our sun will die out much, much before that. Thank you.